Hey, what's up, CS students? We are right here at Spring Retreat, retreat number two, and it has been phenomenal. God has been moving. Students have been having fun. It's been an incredible experience, and we want to invite you in to check this experience out as we have a special message from night one of Spring Retreat. Check this out. Y'all ready? I need something better than that. Y'all ready? All right, let's go. I'm praising the valley. I'm praise on the mountain. Yeah, I praise when I'm sore, I praise when I'm doubting, yeah, I praise when I'm numbered, and I praise when surrounded, cause praise is the waters, my enemies drowning, come on let me hear you guys sing it out, say, as long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise. You hear a melody 
what I know. That, that if those aren't just words to be sung, but those are words to be declared. Right, just because they're on a screen actually doesn't mean you believe them. And if you truly want to find Jesus and you only want him, those aren't just words to say, but they are words to declare over your lives, over your friends' lives, over your families, your communities, your schools. But it's up to you. Jesus is always going to be there. But are you going to declare his name to find him? I'm going to pray for us tonight, and actually that's my prayer tonight as we get into this message, is that you will get to find Jesus. Find him where he's already at, which is right there. So God, I just pray. I pray that you be able to show up. I pray that these students will be able to encounter you tonight that they won't miss the words that you are trying to speak over them. They won't miss the fact that you are right there in the midst with them. God, we give this night to you. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen, amen. Students, you can head back to your seats. Head back to your seats. Hey, I'm so excited to be here with each and every one of you. If we haven't had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Chandler, and I get to look after students at our Boynton Beach campus. Boynton Beach, where are you at? Yeah. And that's what I love to hear. And actually, tonight, we are online. So everybody, I want you to look back at the camera and say, what's up, online? <laughs> hey, I know tonight is gonna be a really great night, and I am excited because I love spring retreat. Spring retreat is one of my favorite things that I get to be a part of. Hey, I know we're going to our seats right now, but shh, keep it quiet, keep it quiet. I don't want us to lose what we were just in. I know we're now sitting next to our friends, but, but what God wants to say to you today and declare over your lives, wait, I, I want you to hear the words... And as we get ready for all that God is going to do in these next couple of days, because I believe God is going to do a lot. We're, we're in this theme of Sunday school. Now this might, you know, show my age a little bit, but I grew up on Veggie Tales in Sunday school. Ah, uh, I love it. You guys still watch Veggie Tales. Awesome. Man, some of you. Okay. My hairbrush, one of the best songs ever, not going to lie. Yeah, uh, look at that. I was so shocked. Awesome. And, and what I know, though, is that was the 90s, you know, because I was born in the 19th, hundreds, 1900s, right? I'm old. 1900s. You guys are all 2000, 20, 10, whatever age you guys are at. Who's, who's the youngest in the room? We got anyone 11? Anyone under 11? Where you at? Oh, nice. Awesome. I love that you guys are here. Here's the thing. I'm so excited that you are here with us. And I'm going to talk about something that's a little bit old in the 90s, right? We had these things in Sunday school called felt boards. And when we would tell stories, the, the Sunday school teacher would get up there and they would start putting characters on the felt board and to tell the story of the Bible, and it was so awesome to watch and be a part of, and you wanted to be the kid who got to put the thing on the felt board. Well, I want to bring us back to Sunday school and back a little bit old school tonight. So this thing in the 90s, it was this really cool book called The Magic Eye. And what we actually got to sell, they were called stereograms that were in this book. And what a stereogram is, it's this image that is really difficult to see unless you look at it from the right perspective. And then all of a sudden, when you have the right angle, it gets really clear. And I actually have a couple for us. I want you to throw up the first one. Right, right. That makes so much sense. You guys see the image in there? Money. What, what do you think it is? Money? money. A bunny? Money. All right, throw up. What is the image? It's a car. You got to have the right perspective. All right, throw the next one up there. Throw the next one up there. You guys are all looking at the same angle. You guys got to look around. I, I need to see different angles, like different angle views. 
All right, all right, show them what it is. Show them what it is. I know, this game's fun. All right, we got one more. One more up here. Throw that one up here. That makes sense. Get, get in the right angle. Who, who's got the best angle? Got to look around. <laughs> Throw it up there. What is it? What is it? You guys had it right at, for the first time. It's a bunny. Right, well, he, here's the thing I want you to know. Right, because tonight what we're going to talk about is how you see things matter. How you look at things matter. And we're going to be looking at some stories of the Bible of his next few days. And I want you to have a clear view of what is trying to be said in the scriptures. Right, because sometimes we, we hear a story from the Bible and we, we don't see it clearly. And so we think it's one thing when really there's a whole different clear picture. And then when you see it, you can't unsee it. And so we're going to be looking specifically tonight at one of my favorite parables. If you don't know what a parable is, a parable is taught by Jesus. It's a story to tell us something about the kingdom of God that, that is coming near or something that has a bigger meaning than we really know. And sometimes Jesus is great and he gives it right to us, he gives the definition. But sometimes he doesn't and he lets us figure out what we need to be looking at. And what I know tonight is that this might be a parable that we've heard before. But I want us to hear it tonight differently. I want us to be able to clear our brains to be able to think clearly of what is trying to be said in this parable. I love reading. And one of my favorite things about reading is that it's almost like a movie in your head. Right, as you're reading through the pages, it's like so vivid that you can see every single moment that is happening and you feel like you are in the story. Well, I feel like sometimes when I read scripture, I just read it to read it and I don't actually put myself in it. So tonight, I want to tell you the story and then I want to break it down a little bit for you. But before I read, what I like to do is close my eyes. So I'm going to ask all of you to close your eyes. And I want to have you clear the thoughts from your head. And I want you to start seeing a house. Keep your eyes closed. It's a big house. Think of it in your head. What does it look like? You don't have to say it out loud. Just think, like, imagine everything about this house. To the right, there's a giant field. And there's a guy that's working in the field. And then what you see is, is there's a father. Now you just walked inside the room and there's a father that is sitting in the main room. And now there's another younger man who walks in. Now I want you to open your eyes. I want you to stay right there with me. Because as we go to talk about the story, I want you to keep that image in your head. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk through the story of Luke chapter 15. It's at the very end of Luke chapter 15. All right, there's two parables that have already been told by Jesus. And, and then he goes to tell a third one immediately after. And that's the image that I want you to start at. That house with the guy that's working outside. And then the father inside. And then another someone walks inside. So keep that image. And so what I want to talk about is, is there's the son who comes up to his father and he comes up, he's got his chest real big and he comes and he is very confident. And he says, dad, I want the money that is earned by me. I, I want the money that is owed to me. And his dad just quietly says, okay, son. And he goes and he divides up his money and he gives one to the younger son and he keeps the other one back for the older who is working down the field for a later time. And the younger one, he takes this and he goes out into the world. And he goes and spends all of the money like that. And before he realizes it, he's starving. And he finds himself eating food where the animals eat, because he has no money for anything else. 
and he comes to a realization. And in this realization, he goes, why am I here? Even the servants at my father's house eat better than this. So he starts to build up the courage to to go back home, to talk to the father, to apologize for all the things that he has done, to apologize for the things that he says. And he starts walking back while he's going through his head, dad, I'm sorry, dad, I'm sorry. Every step, dad, I'm sorry. And as he starts to get close, all of a sudden the dad was always watching and waiting. And he sees as he's looking at the hill, his son. And he gets up immediately and he runs out the front door and he takes off as fast as he can. And before he can even realize it, he's already in the son's arms. The son couldn't even get out what he wanted to say. He he tries and he starts saying, dad, I'm sorry. And the father's just like, no, 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 hold up. Doesn't matter what you say. And finally, one of his servants gets close to him and he goes, hey, I need you to go and get me a couple items. I need you to go and get sandals. I need you to go and get a robe and I need you to go get a ring. And the servant goes and he comes back and, and he places all of these items onto the son and he doesn't even let the son really get into the whole entire story of all the things that has happened. And he says, you know what? We're gonna throw a party because you're home. And so they throw this huge party. And then all of a sudden there's music that is playing. Everyone is having a great time. And then the older brother who was working out in the field the entire time, he goes, what in the world is going on? And he goes and tells one of the servants, what is happening? And the servant says, your brother's home. And all of a sudden he gets incredibly angry. And he doesn't go over to the party. And eventually the father's like, what's going on? Where is the older brother? So he goes to have this conversation with the older brother. And the older brother goes, why have you never given me anything? I've been here the entire time. What about me? And his father just responds, if you only had asked, I would have given it to you. But your brother was lost, but now he's found. So we need to celebrate him. And that's the end. And we don't hear anything more about the older brother. We don't get to hear more about the younger brother. But this is the parable of the lost son. That's found in Luke 15. And and as you're listening to the story, I hope you're able to see the images in your head. Because I want you to know the things that you see, it can be changed by the perspective that you have. And it can give you a whole new meaning. And I hope today I can give you a new meaning of what that story means. See, because as I was first reading this story years ago, I thought, man, this younger son is just like, I'm out of here. Like, it doesn't matter what she give me, I'm, I'm gone. Right? That's what it kind of feels like, right? But actually, the thing I want you to see is that the father lets him. Right? The son actually had no right to just leave. The father allowed it to happen. Let's look right here. Luke 15, verse 12. says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the same share of property that is coming to me. And he, meaning the father, divided his property between them. Here's what I want you to see about first century. When, when this would happen and, and you had an inheritance, if you were in a family, you were only able to receive that inheritance when the father dies. It was not just his whenever he wanted. The father actually had to give it to him. And the father could have just been like, hey, hold up, you're not getting it. Any parents ever say no to you? Really, some of you didn't raise your hand. All your parents say no to you. Any parents ever say no to you? Yeah, exactly. I know for me, my dad used to say no all the time. Right? It's crazy. One of my favorite things in this world, ice cream. Who likes ice cream? All right. Now, who likes Dairy Queen, whatever it's called, Dairy Queen, there it is, ice cream. My favorite. My favorite ice cream in the world is Dairy Queen. I love chocolate ice cream with Oreos and cookie dough blizzard. Man, it's a fast right now, and I can't even tell you how badly I want that. Oh, my goodness. And I remember when I was 10 years old, my dad would take me to Dairy Queen when I would win a baseball game. See, I said win there, not just play. Just want you to get clarity there. Like it was a it was a reward for winning, not just trying. 
And so when I would win a baseball game, my dad would go and take me to Dairy Queen. And every time I'd be like, dad, guess what? I want the large. He'd be like, no. What? It's like, no. All right. Next time we win, dad, the large. No. Okay. I don't think you heard me, dad. I said large. He's like, yeah, small. And then eventually I remember going up to him and said, dad, I want the large. And he said, okay. One condition. You have to eat the whole entire ice cream before you can get up and do anything else. I'm like, dad, 10, easy. Bet, we're doing it, right? And so he gets the large, we sit on down. Third of the way through, I'm like, easy, all day, so good. Halfway, I'm like, okay, uh-oh, this is gonna be a problem. Three-fourths of the way, this is, this is when the bathroom, you know, break needed to happen, because I'm there for a while. And I'm like, dad, I got out of the bathroom. He goes, okay, you can't leave until you finish this. Dad, you don't get it, like, gotta go to the bathroom. He's like, finish the ice cream. All right, and so like, I'm going as much as I can, guys. I don't know if you know this, but like a large back in like the 2000s was actually large, not what they called today. And so it was like a lot. And so I remember going, okay, you just got to get through this. And eventually what felt like hours, hours, I eventually finished the ice cream. I was able to go to the bathroom. Here's a fun fact for you. Kind of like lactose intolerant now. So like, whoo not a good decision on my part back then. But I ended up finishing it. But this is what I learned that day that really changed my perspective. Sometimes my dad says no to things because he knows better. But sometimes he says yes to show me a lesson. And what I want you to see from the father here is he actually said yes to him for running so that he can show him something greater. Right, and then we actually get to continue on in this story. And as the story is continuing, what we see here in verse 17, it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And your father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So as I'm looking at this story and I get to read this part, what I first saw is that this, the son finally was humble enough to go to the dad. And the dad was like, oh, thank goodness you're back. But I used to think it was because like the son did something that actually allowed him to come home. What I ended up learning about this story as I'm really looking at it is that the father lets him return. The father never had to allow him to come home. The father could have saw him, sent a servant out and said, no, you don't get to come here. Right? I needed to change my perspective because it taught me something about God is that it doesn't matter how far off we are, he will always come and get you. He's always going to come and get you. And then as we continue on in the story, right, we get to verse 25 and it says this, meanwhile, the older son, right, that son that we haven't really talked about yet, was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fat calf because he let him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you have given me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friend. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father, said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And see, a perspective shift I had to have in this story as I, I was going through it and reading it and trying to figure out more was I looked at this older brother and I thought he had the right to do this. He's like, this has been against him. But what I love is that the father actually lets him have a little tantrum. Right? The father could have just been like, hey, stop talking. Like, you're going to get in there. Like, my dad made me do things all the time that I didn't want to do. 
He could have done it, but instead, no, the father loved him so much that he actually allowed him to be angry and then teach him something about the anger that he had in that moment. See, I want us to have a clear picture of this story because then I want you to see the audience of who Jesus is talking to in it. See, at the beginning of Luke chapter 15, before he says all three of these parables, he actually tells us who the audience is, and it is so important. There's two group of people he is talking to in the story. The first one is sinners, right, who they would have considered outcasts back in the day. And the other group is religious leaders, or those who thought they were better than everybody else. See, Jesus tells the story to two specific audiences. It's interesting to me that there's two specific audiences and there's two brothers. It's interesting. It's almost like Jesus did it on purpose. But I want you to see the things that Jesus changes because in the story, he changes the way culture would have said about some stuff. He changes the way that we should view some things. And here's the first thing that Jesus changed. Jesus changes the way we actually see God. Right? Jesus changes the way we see God. When, when you look at this parable, he changes the way that the audience who was listening thought about God. I actually want to take a minute right now. And I want you to take out your journals. And if you're online, I want you to go and just pull out a piece of paper. And I want you to write two to three sentences right now of who God is, who you think he is. Right, I remember, and I'm just going to keep talking as you're writing. Right, for, for me, I remember being so young, thinking that God was just like in the sky, this big like creature thing. So I was like six, seven years old. And he just had all this power. And whatever he wanted to do, he could do, but it was totally up to him. No one's going to do nothing about it. He just, if he wants, wants the rainbow there, rainbow there. If he wants this boat to be built, boop, boat built. Like, that's just how I viewed God. Big, powerful creature, like, hanging out in the clouds. And then when I got a little older, I, I realized a little bit more about God. My view still wasn't exactly right. I, I pictured God as this God who wanted to be a part of everything, but at the same time, just wasn't. And so I was like, okay, if something good happened, it's because God wanted to step in. If something bad happened, it's because God didn't want to step in. All right, that was my view when I was in like middle school. Maybe a little bit into high school. God kind of chose when he wanted to step in and that's determined if it was good or bad. But I want you to see how God actually changes the way we view him by the way Jesus tells this parable in this story. Right, the, the younger brother, when he looks at the father, the father being God, right, he, he views him as just a means to an end. He views him as the one who just eventually will die and he will get what he wants. Almost distant. Like you're there when I want something, but if I don't want something, I don't got to go to you. And maybe you kind of view God like that too. If we're being honest. Maybe you view God as if like, hey, I have this prayer and I'm going to go to you when I want something, but if I don't really want something at the time, it's great that you're over there. Oh, oh God, I have a request again. I'm back. Dear God, I need a grade on an A on this test. And then you don't need something to oh, la, 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 just live my life. Oh, there, there's a tragedy going on in my family. God, I need you. Whoop. Stop thinking about him. We use God as if he's like a genie who's just going to grant us wishes when we want. Then we don't want something, we're kind of away. But I love in the story is that, no, 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 no. This is a God who loves me, who cares about me, who wants good things for me, but who also will give me lessons along the way that are difficult for me to understand. Now, he's not just only in the good things, but he's also helping me alongside of me in the bad. And guiding me to where I need to go. See, we have to shift the way that we see God. Because when we change our view of how to look at God, what's beautiful is that we start seeing him differently. We start asking different things. When we only see God as a God who's going to grant us wishes, we treat him like that. But when we see God as someone who loves us, we talk to him. We want to know him. 
So we have to maybe change the way that we see God. Another thing that we get to do in this story is Jesus actually changes the way that we see ourselves. See, the younger brother at the very beginning, right, because he was prideful and he saw himself as like this big shot. He walked up to his dad with all the confidence in the world and said something that he probably never would have said if he had the right heart. But because he viewed himself as one thing, he treated his father that way. And then later on in that story, when he, he realized that he actually was at the lowest of lows and he put himself in this position of zero, he treated himself as zero. Or he didn't go to his father humbly, he went to his father scared. Or he wasn't like, oh, I, I just have to humble myself. No, 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 it wasn't humility that brought him back to the father. It honestly was being scared that brought him back to God. But what's interesting, what's interesting is his perspective of himself determined his position. Right, because when he thought he was nothing, he actually asked to take the lowest place in the house. But when he thought he was everything, he thought himself better than his father. See, the way he viewed himself actually changed the way that he acted to everyone else. And maybe you need to have a reality check on yourself. Because the way that you view yourself matters because the way that you probably treat others around you. If you think you're better than somebody else, you're going to act like it. And maybe if you think of yourself as this negative person who no one wants to love, that no one cares about, that, that literally people just don't want to be around, you're going to start believing it. And what I know is when you put yourself at a place that thinks that no one is going to love you, you won't allow yourself to have anyone love you. And when you put yourself above everybody else, nobody wants to be around you. Maybe tonight you need to view yourself and go, am I viewing myself like the younger brother? Or am I going to view myself the way that Jesus just told me to view myself? Because if you think about it, what does the father do? He says, no, 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 no. Don't think of yourself as low. Instead, you are a part of my family. I want to put you at the right hand of me. I want to place the family ring on your finger. I want to put the robe on you that signifies comfort. I want to put sandals at your feet, which is going to say, hey, you are worthy. You actually have worth. I don't want you to think that you're down here, but instead, I want you to realize your rightful place in my house. Maybe tonight you just need to hear that you're supposed to be at the right hand of God. That God loves you so much that he sees you as worthy. You got to stop telling yourself all these negative things about you and start looking at the word of God and what he says about you, which is loved, treasured, you're one of his. You're his masterpiece. You're a masterpiece of the creator of the universe. You're loved. Sometimes we're not living it. But Jesus right here, I think he looked at the sinners that are there. And he, he looks at them and he goes, you're not worthless. You're not supposed to be an outcast. But instead, you're a part of my family. I want you close. And he says that to you today. And then we keep going. And Jesus actually does one more thing that I love is he changes the way that we see salvation. He changes the way we need to view salvation because if you're like me when I was younger, I thought I could do all of this stuff and then eventually like I was good enough and then I get to heaven. Right, like, okay, I'm a pastor's kid, so I'm gonna go and talk to this person. I'm gonna go over here and serve in kids ministry. I'm gonna learn how to play guitar so I can be on the worship team. I'm gonna go do this. I'm gonna go do this. I started being around all this stuff, but I actually missed the heart of God. See, what Jesus does here when he looks at the younger son and he tells us about him, right, the younger son, 
the way that he viewed salvation is he had to work for it and do all of these things because he was so far in sin and then he was able to come back home and he's like, if you just put me as a servant in your household, eventually I can work enough and then I can earn my way back home. But no, no, no. God doesn't say that. He doesn't go, hey, you got to work and do all this stuff for me. He goes, no, no, no. I accept you just as you are. I want you to come home. I want you to be here with me. We really haven't talked about it a lot, but the older brother, see, he thought that if he just continued to obey all the things that the father asked, eventually it would just be his birthright. Just eventually it would happen. Right? He's just like, I'm going to stay over in this corner I'm going to do all these different things and then eventually I'll get recognized. Right? He's like, dad, you never even got even a small goat from my family. You never recognized me. He's like, just ask. Just ask me. See, if we're not careful, we'll be around all the things of God, but we actually won't know God. And for some of you, you might be doing all of the things. I'm going to spring retreat. I'm going to go to movement camp. Uh, I went and served over here. I kind of just kept my head down. I'm, I'm doing all the things my student pastor says. You might be doing all the things your student pastor says, but are you doing all the things that God is telling you to do? Are you just around his house or are you in it? See, some of you have been going to church for a really long time and you've heard this for similar message over and over and you almost have gotten so comfortable with it that you haven't actually seen it. And tonight, my prayer is that you see it and you decide to respond to it. And you start saying, I don't want to just be around God. I want to know him. Because he wants to know you. It's great that you're doing all these things. But are you doing them for yourself or for him? It matters the way you see it. And then when you start seeing it correctly, everything changes. And everything, if I'm being honest, it has to change. Right? And this is what I learned from all of this is that the Father's love, it changes us. The Father's love if we truly know the Father's love and we allow it to take over in our lives, it'll change you. And as we go and reflect through this story of the prodigal son and we look, it's not just actually one lost son, but it's lost sons because both of them are in the wrong. It's not just one, it's both. So often we celebrate the younger one and we condemn the older one. But if we are being honest with ourselves, we're more a lot like the older brother than the younger one. But maybe you are in this room and, and you go, you know what? I actually have never decided to come home and, and I've never actually realized the sin that is in my life and, and I, I never realized that I've actually pushed God aside and only have done the things that I want. Well, tonight is the night where you can say, I'm coming home. That God, I want you. I want your love. But maybe tonight that, that, that's truly what you have to say. And I just want you to know it does not matter how far off you were or even how far off you are. As soon as you start coming home, the Father is going to see you, he's going to run to you, and he's going to embrace you. But what I love about the prodigal son is that it wasn't until he turned around and started coming home that the Father ran to him. So you can make the choice to stay where you're at or you can choose to see God the way that he's supposed to be seen, a loving God who sent his son down on this earth to live a perfect life for you, to go to a cross, die a death he did not deserve because you deserved it. 
And he took all of your sin upon himself so that one day when you proclaim his name, you will be able to be saved and you will be able to spend the rest of your life in his house. But you have to choose. Or maybe you recognize yourself a little bit more with the older brother. You've done a bunch of stuff and you really haven't started getting to know God. Or you know God, but you've kind of gotten really comfortable just doing the stuff and you stopped realizing what you're doing it for. Tonight's your night to go, I'm done doing that. I want to celebrate and I want to live fully in the life that God has for me. I want to go in the house, not just work around the house. So I'm going to pray for us right now. And if you were that first one who recognized, hey, I'm like the younger brother and you want to know Jesus and you want to start living your life for him tonight, this first prayer is actually going to be for you. And then after I say amen, we're actually going to have a chance to respond. And the way that we're going to respond tonight is I want you to see the front right here of this platform as if you are deciding to get up out of your seat and you want to run home to the Father. And if that is you, after we pray, you can just come right up here. You can kneel right here and you can say, God, I'm going to throw my sin right here on the ground. I don't want it anymore. I'm going to give it to you because I just want all of you and none of me. And so with every head bowed and eye closed right now. If you are that younger brother and you're deciding right now that you want to come home, I want you to have the boldness to make the choice with with no one looking around to put your hand up in the air and say, that's me. Yeah. I love that. And all of us, we're going to pray this prayer together. And if your hand is raised, I want you to pray it a little bit louder. And then when we say amen, no matter what decision you have made today, I want you to come to the front of the stage. And I want you to get on your knees only if you mean it. And declare before the King of Kings that you are his. And so I want everybody in this room to repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I know I'm a sinner. I know I have failed. But today, I choose you. I love you. I will do my best to live for you the best I know how. In your son's name I pray. Amen.